The reading this evening is from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. The Word of Life. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the Word of Life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Can I begin this evening's series on 1 John by saying something patently obvious? And you may find it helpful to have the letter open in front of you, 1 John. Uh, it is quite simply this, that what we're looking at is 1 John. It's not 1 Peter, <laughs> and it's not 1 St. Paul. In other words, it is a piece of scripture which was written by an individual not by Peter, not by Paul, but someone called John, most likely uh, who is known as the beloved apostle, the friend of Jesus, and the author of Second and Third John, and also the book of Revelation. Uh, Watchman Nee, in his helpful book some time ago, What Shall This Man Do?, encourages us to see how God calls people from diverse backgrounds for specific tasks. And in that book, he suggests that the distinctive ministries of John, Peter, and Paul can be distinguished by and character characterized by the tasks that each of these disciples were performing when they were called by God. When God calls someone to the Christian life, uh, he doesn't obliterate the natural skills and abilities that that person has been uh, gifted with. Rather, he redirects them and refocuses them. So Peter, for example, when he was called, the Lord found him casting a net out into the sea. He was fishing. And that work of fishing for men is character, characterized by Peter throughout his life. So on the day of Pentecost, for example, 3,000 people were gathered into the net. The Apostle Paul, well, he was tasked with a different responsibility. Um, when the Lord called Paul, he was a tent maker. He made things. He built things. And that was the ministry which was entrusted to the Apostle Paul. He, in turn, enabled and built the great doctrinal foundations upon which the Christian faith rests and entrusted with the task of establishing newly constructed congregations. He was a builder. But John, he's very different from Peter and Paul. When John was called, he was found mending nets. So John is a mender. And in this little book written towards the end of the first century uh, of the first Christian era, when the church had been in existence for some decades, it was a time when there were some dangerous teachings coming in to the church. And there was a need for someone to call people back to the central truths of the gospel. And so it was John's task to mend the nets, to assure his dear friends, people probably located in Ephesus, that the entire basis of the Christian faith rests not just on a set of propositions or concepts, but upon a real and personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. And that is the distinctiveness about this little book that we will be exploring these Sunday evenings over the summertime. It was written by John the Mender. So what was the purpose why John felt the need to put words to paper or parchment? There's always a reason why somebody writes a book. Well, we don't have to speculate hard. 
why John took time and effort to write, because he tells us, and there are four different reasons John gives for writing. The first is located in the passage we've just read together, chapter 1, verse 4. We write to make your joy and our joy complete. That's the first reason John wrote this pamphlet. Bring about joy. That's okay. Then in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you may not sin. Well, that's a pretty compelling reason for putting pen to paper. Third reason, chapter 2, verse 26, I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. That's what we've been talking about, the apostasy coming into the church. And then finally, chapter 5, verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. He's writing about Christian assurance. Now, sometimes it's helpful to turn things the other way round and see if by doing that we gain greater clarity. So let's look at these four these four things. Evidently, these Christian believers in Ephesus were having the joy of the Lord sucked out of them. There were some people or some circumstances that were draining them of the joy of the Lord. And John wants to help these believers to have that joy restored renewed. Christian faith without joy is like a canary that doesn't sing. It's dangerous. A number of weeks ago when it was a wee bit cooler, uh, Claire and I were watching television and enjoying the warmth of the gas fire in the man's front room when our carbon monoxide bleeper leaped. And do you know something? It was very tempting simply to knock it off and ignore its warning. But we didn't. We opened the windows and we opened the doors in case there was some dangerous gas level in the room. And so it turned out to be. A few days later, I called a sweep to clear the chimney and he found an enormous crow's nest which filled an entire black bin bag of twigs and debris. And that's what had blocked the fumes from escaping. In the early days of coal mining, the miners brought canaries into the mine, mines. A canary's metabolism is very sensitive to air quality. And as long as the wee bright yellow bird was chirping, the miners knew the air was safe. If the canaries wobbled in their perch and landed dead on the floor, they knew to make a quick exit. When your heart stops singing, it is a warning that something toxic is in the air. And John wanted these believers to have their joy restored. And then secondly, evidently, the Christian believers were feeling guilty because of sin that weighed heavily upon their hearts and minds. Chapter 2, verse 1. And it's interesting that John doesn't come out with some sort of pathetic moralism you have nothing to feel guilty about. That's a very current placebo. Instead, he acknowledges that sin is indeed a huge threat to the joy and the happiness of believers. But the solution, chapter 1, verse 8, to the feelings of guilt is not by throwing them back upon themselves or pretending that it doesn't exist, but by, te- by telling the Christians just to try harder and to be a better person. Instead, verse 9, he throws them onto Jesus. And he assures that when, when we run to Christ, when we admit our sin to him, he will never, ever let us down. He will be true to himself. He will forgive our sins. He will purify us from all wrongdoing. How good is that? So, The joy, forgiveness of sins, two good reasons why John is writing this letter to these believers. The third reason the believers in Ephesus were feeling so unhappy, we can see is located in chapter 2, verse 26, because they came across some people who were trying to lead them astray. Now, they were aware that there was something not quite right, but they weren't quite sure what it was. And John is able to help them identify the issue. What were these new teachers saying about Christ? 
How central was Jesus in the life of their congregation? His birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. No one who denies the Son as the Father, chapter 2, verse 23. Whoever acknowledges the Son as the Father also. Not long ago, a friend was expressing to me their their unease about the pastor of their church and the demands that he was making of his fellowship. Why were they feeling ill at ease by this direction of travel? Well, surprise, surprise, it was because something else had come into his teaching, not to replace Jesus, but to add to Jesus. And that became a red warning light to our friends. Let's be careful that Christ is central, that he is the main focus of our attention, not anything or anyone else. So these Christian people urgently needed their joy restored, their guilt forgiven, and their focus reoriented onto Jesus. And fourthly, then, these believers needed assurance that they could know for sure that they would enjoy eternal life. Well, what is the basis of our assurance that when we die, we'll go to heaven? Me? Quality of my faith? I don't think so. How good I am, how hard I'm trying to be a good person, there, that really wouldn't inspire a whole lot of confidence. The basis of our assurance, chapter 5, verse 10, is trust in the Son of God. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in their heart. And so, in chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, very briefly we return to this opening paragraph of John's first letter. And actually, the first sentence, verses 1 through to 4a, Mark, you'll be interested in this, is almost one complete sentence. It's breathless. The first four verses in the Greek has no punctuation. And so here he points us not to the dawning of a new philosophical or spiritual insight, not to the arrival or discovery of some new message proclaimed, but in a breathless, almost ecstatic way, he points us to this personal divine word of life which has appeared. Jesus has appeared not just theoretically, but actually. Here is someone John has seen with his very own eyes. He has looked at him. He has had him appear to him, verse 2. And that is what we proclaim to you, what we have seen, what we've heard, and what we've touched. You get the picture? He's excited about this. Our faith is based on Jesus, who we've seen. I've spent time with him. So the basis of the Christian faith is the real life, flesh and blood Jesus. John is telling these troubled, anxious believers in Ephesus not to be distracted by others who want to draw away their joy, but have their faith renewed as they focus on Jesus. Well, that's okay, isn't it? It is because Jesus, the giver of life, verse 1, has appeared to John and his associates in visible and tangible form that believers are able to know him. John has heard him, he's seen him, he's looked at him, he's, he's touched him, and now he proclaims Jesus to others with accuracy and authority. And more than that, he says, our fellowship depends not just on Jesus having appeared, but friendship or fellowship at a personal, intimate level is available, is in fact only possible through the one who from the very beginning enjoyed union and communion with God, his loving Heavenly Father. And this fellowship in turn, John contends, in a breathtaking addendum, friendship with God 
is therefore only possible through friendship with John, with the apostles, with those who have seen, who have listened, who have heard, who have touched. So for John and John's first readers and then for subsequent generations, fellowship with God through Jesus takes place how? By hearing and believing the apostolic gospel. This is why Jesus appeared. This is why Jesus must be proclaimed. And so tonight, however we might be feeling, happy or sad, full of energy or utterly worn out and spiritually weary, here we have John, the mender of nets, pointing to the one who mends broken hearts, who restores joy, who forgives our sins, who keeps us on the right track, who assures us of life everlasting. Isn't it just the most wonderful privilege there to come at Jesus' invitation to his table? the same table which Jesus shared with John and his other disciples, to partake tangibly in these physical elements of bread and wine which speak so eloquently of the present relational incarnate Lord Jesus who has come among us, who sits among us, so that we may enjoy union and communion with the Father and the Spirit for all eternity. Come then. Let's find our joy renewed. Let's find our sins forgiven. Let's stop going wrong. Let's have assurance of life eternal.